Excellency Sim Sok Heng, Secretary of State, Ministry of Commerce. Excellency Sok Stefana, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all uh, and a very warm welcome to this dialogue. On behalf of the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, AREA, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you and to co-host this event with the Ministry of Commerce and to share this platform with His Excellency Sim Sok Heng. And can I say after two and a half years absence, how happy I am to be back here in Phnom Penh and how much I look forward to meeting with some of you who are also in Phnom Penh over the next few days. AREA conducts research and provides policy advice around strengthening regional economic integration and narrowing development gaps. We work with our partners as mandated by the ASEAN finance ministers in 2008, which are the ASEAN secretariat, the ASEAN chair, and individual ASEAN member states. The framework for discussions about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, was a significant achievement of Cambodia's 2012 chairmanship of ASEAN, and DARIA has been supporting RCEP, sent, RCEP since, both technical support during the negotiations, along with studies, and now through our capacity building program, supporting member states to prepare for and implement their commitments under RCEP. We are pleased to be able to co-host events such as this, bringing the business community together with government officials to learn and to share information about the RCEP agreement. The success of the agreement will depend on it being utilized by businesses and the benefits they gain from it. So events such as this are very important for this process. Today's public-private dialogue is, in, is the third in a series of five uh, discussions in the, under the Unpackaging the RCEP Agreement, co-hosted with the Ministry of Commerce. So to open this dialogue on behalf of the Ministry of Commerce, it gives me great pleasure to invite His Excellency Sim Sok Heng to deliver his opening comments. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, and uh, thank you uh, all the people who rank behind the scene. Uh, first of all, let me uh, respect to my senior, Excellency Sok Sipana, uh, the senior advisor to the Yora government of Cambodia, who are with us and guiding us uh, uh, from the first uh, unpack uh, from the e-commerce uh, until now. And also to uh, Director Jeremy, uh, who are represent area, and uh, you are very active and thank for always uh, supporting us. And uh, today I'm very uh, happy and uh, to see that we are come to the third awesome private uh, sector uh, dialogue on trade and service. Uh, and I would like to welcome all the participants and some of my colleagues with me here and other online and I see they are interesting and some even uh, some of the negotiators even they are not in service they also told me that they are very eager to join and they say please uh, come to join more and we are in negotiation on that time about eight years ten years ago so now it is a time to unpack uh, to utilize so all of you have to revisit back and also prepare for future negotiation as well I say to them and they are happy here so uh, I take the opportunity to express my uh, thanks again to area and also the Australia government uh, as well, uh, who always support the other area to the Ministry of Commerce. And also to my colleague, especially uh, the Department of Asia Pacific who are with me today, they are ranked very well, working very well with you, Jeremy, and also Swan to make this happen today. I believe uh, today dialogue is a great opportunity for the private and the public. Many of the public officers also attend. Uh, they are chit chat in the group. Some are able to go in, some are still not, but hope they are touch up the good part uh, later on as well. So this is, uh, I uh, regard this is very important. Let me start with uh, calling a little bit history. 
the odds of negotiation uh, we are uh, negotiate based on WTO commitment that we did. And he says is here, who are the chief negotiator for WTO session on that time. We are maintained that is a, a very uh, solid baseline uh, for us uh, there. And uh, we also opening some uh, two more subsector related to the scientific research for the economic, because you know already we want to grow our economic. So we want the think tank uh, to come in and all who are very expert economically something like that so we open that sector and the second sector is scientific in agriculture you know agriculture is very important uh, the modern agriculture country we need advanced technology and we hope this unlock us for the uh, export agriculture export as well including sps so why we consider to add more to sub sector like i mentioned uh, based on uh, the wto go on that one another good deal you may see that Cambodian start export our service and uh, two months ago, some you may know that uh, Cambodian be able to produce the best chef. And this is another service, the best chef. And they are in the five star in Dubai uh, to uh, make uh, there and let on they serve there. This is Cambodian. And also there are a lot of Cambodia, uh, the IT, even they are not at one uh, in IT, but at least certain in IT technician, they are also something working uh, together there as well. So this is uh, very, uh, uh, promising and a lot of uh, young people who are starting in this uh, service who are providing there. I no need to recall how uh, much the service uh, contribute to the EP as all of us may know. Some rank from 40 to 70 percent in some ASEAN depend on country to country and uh, to contribute to GDP and Cambodian also starting this as we also based on the tourism as well. So part of that, this is the agriculture, uh, the service that we are doing that as well. So why I'm always uh, hope that uh, we are able to, uh, to unlock and to see more how we are able to attract more, uh, more city, especially come to invest here and later on we are able to continue some uh, to what to complement or to combine to push for our proposal of export to service. And you may see the government also set up the policy, especially for technical and vocational education policy uh, from 2017 to 2025, and also steam the what the, we call the science technology engineering and math as well. 2015 to 25. This is also the thing that we are want to push for the service as well to meet the labor. Uh, the, the labor market. At the same time, you may see already uh, from year to year, Cambodian also starting. I may use the word manpower rather than export uh, worker, uh, export the manpower to other countries to provide some certain service that they are able to, uh, pro uh, to learn uh, when they provide that and they also learn other something new and they can come back as well to contribute to our development back. So this is some point that I wish to mention, but at the same time, uh, as uh, Australia already support that one, I may uh, directly uh, suggest to the Australia uh, government may also consider uh, to uh, invest uh, in Cambodian. Uh, as you may see already, the mode three is the among the four mode that use most. Uh, we can supply over 50% of the mode three. This is I talking in the world as well. And we also import some service from Australia as well. Uh, so you may see some of the management in the golf, the best golf court here is uh, managed by uh, Australia as well. And even some uh, legal service who are also used to be my uh, law professor as well, who also provides some uh, legal service here in Cambodia. So this is another thing we import and also we would like to export uh, to find uh, some complementary and some also member already uh, using uh, more and more of our uh, service supply as well. So this is a good thing. So I hope today uh, we are able to see more and to learn more uh, and also to understand more from private sector, how the private sector challenge in using the service in also and also what you need more on also and able to advise. And uh, I thank uh, Jeremy, uh, you designed a very good program. And the end, uh, Dr. Soksipana will sum up uh, to find out this is a good thing that we're able to continue to use. And beside that, if uh, you're able, please uh, help us more uh, to uh, 
uh, design, you may know already, uh, service if we count by subsector is about 160, but we cannot focus all 160 in one time. So what Cambodian should be focused? Maybe five to 10 subsector. Uh, you have a fully study and also show us and what a trend uh, the service may need now that we should focus on. And you may see uh, the new development, uh, reason, man, reason, uh, week. Uh, there are a lot of dynamic in the, here in Asia. So we have to prepare ourselves what is coming next uh, for the trend service that we should prepare ourselves and we focus on now on. So if area able to support this and advise this, uh, furthermore, it would be very important. I strongly support your mention on the early opening. The key success of also is utilize. If without utilization, it's nothing. So this is another important. So in that uh, policy paper or anything, the study should be advised on how utilize the service as well for Cambodian and also mention on the LDC uh, service waiver. As you may see, even in the also we also have some transition period, especially uh, to negative list as well, uh, because we are still LDC there. But at the same time, we also have to prepare ahead. If we are able to jump over, we have jump over before time, uh, then that uh, we are, uh, they allow us to be there as well. So this is uh, what I want to stay on. Um, uh, before I ending, I would like to thank again the to area and also all the speaker here. And I'm happy to see Dr. Soksipana here and also Dr. Eborat here, who are very key uh, and also contribute a lot. Um, also, even from during negotiation, I uh, used to listen to them as well from that time. And uh, I may end up by uh, get your permission, Jeremy, or maybe Swan, uh, to stay, uh, listen to you all because I see very good speaker. I will stay until the end and uh, just allow me to listen uh, without uh, by off the camera so I can learn more. Uh, this is very interesting uh, subject. I can say, so we in the future, FDA, more focus on service because trade in good we cut 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 tariff almost uh, left only some percentage only uh, in awesome uh, you can see how number we cut less than 10 percent already uh, that we need to open more but service is uh, something that has, uh, we have about half more uh, i mean 50 50 percent are still going on so this is uh, very important so may i wish uh, all of the of you uh, have a very active and fruitful discussion uh, this morning and please stay safe and healthy thank you so much for your kind attention thank you thank you very much excellency simsok heng for your generous words uh i'm very pleased to see as, as we just mentioned that the obviously the the success of uh the rcep is agree agreement is the the number of people who utilize it so just to see that already over 160 and near close to 170 people are tuned into this uh, dialogue shows that people really do understand the importance of uh, tapping into the potential that uh, is arising from the RCEP agreement. We also very much take the hints. Uh, I heard what, what you said about uh, uh, you, your hopes for future area programs. And I, I'm sure in addition, there were maybe some Australian government officials, Australian private sector, who also heard your suggestions uh, about increasing the interaction with Australia. So thank you very much. And of course, we are more than honored if you want uh, to join and uh, uh, observe the, the whole of today's dialogue. So thank you for, for your opening comments and please do stay. Uh, we are very fortunate to be able to bring together a very distinguished panel of experts for today's discussion on services. So on behalf of Area Capacity Building Programme, may I express my sincere appreciation to all the panellists. Burik Ratana, Harrison Wong. White, Ashley Irving, and Sven Kalabo. Uh, so thank you for bringing your formidable personal, institutional, and private sector perspectives to today's discussion. May I express my deepest gratitude to the Australian government for its support of the capacity building program uh, over the last seven years and the 
very wide range of activities that we've been able to bring. I hope today's uh, dialogue will be stimulating for you all provide the support you need to navigate your way around the opportunities from the RCEP agreement. So on that, can I wish everyone ending today, uh, people observing as well as the, the panelists, all, all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, good morning, Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, public private dialogue on unpacking the AirSafe agreement for Cambodian businesses, especially for those of you who have just joined us. Uh, we have more than 160 participants right now. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, this is the third dialogue of our series of five, uh, following our public private dialogue on e commerce, which was the first one, and the one on rules of origin earlier this year. Our next PPD, if you're interested in other uh, events, We'll focus on investment, the chapter of investment of our set next month. And the final one for Cambodia will be on custom procedures and trade facilitator chapter around July of this year. For those of you who are interested, we are also having a similar series of public private dialogue events in Lao PDR for Lao businesses. So as Jeremy mentioned, this event is brought to you by AREA in partnership with the Ministry of Commerce of the Royal Government of Cambodia and with the funding from the Austrian Department of Foreign, and Trade, Foreign Affairs and Trade. My name is Sven Kalebo. I'm an international trade consultant at AREA and I have the pleasure to be the moderator for this dialogue today. Uh, before sharing the reasons of our presence here and His Excellency already gave a few hints at what we have to focus on uh, and sharing with you the objective of the webinar. I would like to also acknowledge the presence of, and welcome His Excellency Soksipana, uh, Senior Advisor to the Royal Government of Cambodia and His Excellency Sim Sokeng, Secretary of State at the Ministry of Commerce, who both were at some time in my career my supervisors. So I'm very happy to uh, see them here. Um, with this, I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen in order for you to be more um, uh, aware of the topic of uh, this training. I hope everybody can see my screen now. So this is our series of events on unpacking the RCEP agreement. As His Excellency mentioned in his introduction, the purpose of this event is not to revisit the negotiations, to look at the detailed article in the chapter, but really to start utilizing, as His Excellency mentioned, unpacking the con contents of this agreement for businesses. Because eventually the businesses are the one trading goods and services. So they are the ones who have to understand how to avail, how to make take advantage of all uh, these RCEP chapters. So as you all know, I'm sure, the RCEP entered into force on the 1st January of this year. And it is basically covering 30% of the world GDP. It represents 2.3 trillion US dollars of trading goods among RCEP members. And 90% of tariffs on goods being eliminated within the 15 economies it is expected uh, to create a boost to inter-regional export of up to 42 billion US dollars. And the gains to be had from trade diversion represent 60% and from new trade trade creation represent 40%. You can see here on the screen how RCEP compares to other uh, trading blocks. The RCEP agreement contains 20 chapters and a number of annexes. As we've mentioned earlier, we are not able to cover all the chapters and all the services or all the goods uh, included in the agreements, but we are focusing on a few of them. We have covered the chapter 12 on electronic commerce. We have ch covered chapter two on trading goods and rules of origin. Today, we are covering the trading services chapter. Next month, we'll be covering the investment chapter. And finally, in July, we'll be covering the custom procedures and trade passation chapter, chapter four. What is the objective of this webinar? 
it is primarily for you to have a good understanding of the asset chapter on trading services, what it is, what it is not, what opportunities it creates, for whom, what are the services included and excluded from this agreement. Second, to appreciate the opportunities and the challenges faced by Cambodian businesses in using RCEP, be them for there to welcome investment into Cambodia or, as His Excellency mentioned, to export Cambodian services overseas. And finally, as His Excellency just started, we hope that by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to identify what are the information gaps, what are the capacity gaps, especially for businesses to take advantage of this uh, agreement. And obviously, we would like to start addressing some of these um, issues. So this webinar will take more or less uh, two hours. We have already covered the uh, opening remarks. Um, the first session we call setting the scene on the OSEP trade services provision. We have invited, I would say again, uh, Deborah Ems, who is the founder and the CEO of the Asian Trade Center as well as uh, Tim O'Connor, the head of Cambodia Tax Practice and the Cambodia Deputy Managing Director at the FDM, to tell us more about the agreement, the chapter on trading services, what it means for businesses, what it means for Cambodian businesses. So we have a kind of, of uh, level playing field for everyone in the room to understand the second session, which is about the private sector perspective on the opportunities for Cambodia in trading services, we have four distinguished panelists with us representing different sectors of the Cambodian uh, economy. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Kailot, um, who is a business owner and independent director. We have Ms. Huri Kratana, who is a private sector and investment specialist, as well as an independent director and a chairperson of the Cambodia Community of Investment Professional. We have Mr. Harrison Weiss, who is the CEO of Cambodia Investment Review, CIR Media. And we have Mr. Ashley. Irving, the president of the IDT and the vice president of Ostcham Cambodia. Finally, we have the pleasure to have His Excellency Soxi Panna, senior advisor to the Royal Government of Cambodia, to provide us with his knowledge, I would say also his wisdom, gathered over, I would not say how many years or decades, but many years of uh, practicing, of advising, of negotiations, uh, to provide a summary of the discussions that we have today and as well as what are the key items of a continued public-private dialogue on trading services. So we have quite a pack agenda for today. I hope we'll be able to uh, stick to the timeline that we are proposing to you. And without further ado, I'd like to um, enter into our first session, which is on setting the scene on the RCEP trading services provision. And for this, I have two distinguished experts, I have Dr. Deborah Ems, uh, who is the director and the founder, I would say the director and the founder of the Asian Trade Center, Asian, like A-S-I-A-N. Uh, the Asian Trade Center is actually working with government and companies to design better trade policies for the region. Dr. Elms is the president as well of the Asia Business Trade Association, ABTA. She was a, a senior fellow in the Singapore Ministry of Trade and Industry Trade Academy. And previously, Dr. Elms was the head of the Temasek Foundation Center for Trade and Negotiations and a senior fellow of the International Political Economy at the Rajaratnam School of International Study in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, joining, um, joining Deborah in uh, this uh, first session will be Clint O'Connor, who is a partner a head of Cambodia Tax Practice and the Cambodia Deputy Managing Director at the FDM, a law firm here based in Cambodia. Clint has worked professionally in Cambodia for over 10 years. He has been the key tax advisor to a number of large multinational and regional businesses that have or are looking to invest in Cambodia, as well as providing tax assistance for many local businesses. He is widely recognized for his work on taxations as a distinguished practitioner by Asia Law 2022 and highly regarded in the IFLO 1000. He was also ranked as a highly regarded lawyer in the World Tax 2022. With this, uh, I would like to invite our two uh, panelists to the front. And I am going to ask uh, a few questions. Hi, Deborah. Thank you for joining. 
I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Deborah, on, well, as you've done so uh, well uh, and fabulously in the previous episodes, I think uh, it's important just to start to understand what RCEP is and what are these provisions on trade and services and also what sector are included uh, or excluded from uh, this uh, chapter. Mm. Thank you, Deborah, for joining us. Over to you. Sure. Let me share my screen. I have a PowerPoint ready to go. Share and ta -ta. give it a second. There we go. Uh, so very happy to be here and, and very delighted to see so many enthusiastic participants uh, back and forth saying hello on the chat. I wish that we could potentially be all in the same room so that we could say hi to each other, but appreciate the opportunity to be here in front of such a large audience to discuss RCEP and trade and services. Also very happy to, to be with the Ministry of Commerce once more and with IRIA. I think these are two institutions that frankly have been leading the way in trying to get companies especially ready for RCEP and to be able to take advantage of it. An agreement that sits in a drawer is frankly useless. And so I think it's, it's really, in my view, very promising to see how much work uh, Cambodia especially has invested in trying to make sure that Cambodian-based companies are ready for RCEP. Let me just start with a little bit of background in case that you haven't been paying much attention to RCEP. We have 15 countries in the region that are part of this, including all 10 members of ASEAN, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. It entered into force for 12 of those countries. We are still missing Myanmar, Philippines, and Indonesia, but all of the others it's entered into force, including of course for Cambodia itself. This is an agreement that was built on ASEAN's approach to handling trade and trade agreements. So for many of you who have been doing business in this region already, you should feel quite comfortable with the way that RCEP approaches many things related to trade because it reflects the way that ASEAN manages trade integration and especially the way that ASEAN does it's what it calls its ASEAN plus one agreement. So ASEAN China or ASEAN Japan, Many of you, again, may be familiar with how that looks in your sector. RCEP is similar, but with a giant but, there are some differences. And so please do be careful if you are using RCEP that you are following the rules that are in RCEP and not the rules in some other agreement. Like any trade agreement, RCEP works for trade between two RCEP participating parties when you follow the rules. So you can't use RCEP to trade with India, which is not a member, or the United States, which is not a member, but within RCEP economies. Uh, and all of the texts and schedules are available. There are lots of websites. The Ministry of Commerce has one. Uh, the RCEP Secretariat, which is not yet active, but the ASEAN Secretariat put, put together some materials. I personally use the one from New Zealand because I find it a little bit easier to navigate. So here is the text. You will have copies of these slides, or you can get copies of these slides after the fact. So. Trade in services is interesting. Typically, when we do a trade agreement, the focus is always on trade in goods because they're easier to see, they're easier to measure. Uh, and so we focus a lot on how do we move goods like textiles, footwear, coffee cups, agricultural products. But actually services are a growing part of trade and a growing part of economies across the RCEP region. And so it's very important to think about how do we make rules that apply for services companies and how do we give more opportunities for services companies to compete in the region? And that's, I think, a crucial part of what RCEP does. It's different in many ways from what ASEAN has done in the past because we've had very limited commitments around trading services. So RCEP starts to make that possibility of delivering services easier, faster, uh, and with more flexibility in and around the 12 participating countries. Many of you who are in services, businesses of all kinds, you could be providing legal services, you could do graphic design, you could be in logistics services, you might be in travel and tourism, you're already engaged in trade and services, many of you cross border. So you can do that already, but, and this is the key but, Access and protection is not guaranteed. So you can have a, a, a country that you're supplying services to 
suddenly change the rules and all of a sudden your business is now not viable anymore and you end up losing that market. What RCEP does is it helps provide consistent rules so that you have more certainty and lowered risk as a company of delivering services across borders in the region. That is very helpful for firms, especially smaller services firms that are trying to invest in the right kinds of markets. So RCEP allows services companies greater risk, more certainty that the rules will not suddenly shift, that they will not suddenly find themselves unable to compete. That's very important. It doesn't just apply to the RCEP countries. Sometimes when we do a better job of doing trade, like being more transparent about the rules, it matters for all companies, whether they're in RCEP or not, whether they're taking advantage of the agreement or not, transparency helps all of us. Uh, but what RCEP does do is it helps limit some of the discrimination that services firms may face when they are trying to do business in and across the region and give them more opportunities to compete. Like all trade agreements, there are sort of two key parts to the trade and services elements of RCEP. The first is the chapter on rules, and those rules can be very important to companies, even if you don't feel like they matter to you. They actually matter a lot to you because it's about limiting what government can do so that it provides greater certainty for businesses. And second, there are schedules where every participating member commits to doing certain kinds of things, allowing certain kinds of services activities, having limits on other kinds of services activities. So two parts, the rules and the country specific schedules. So that is very typical in a trade agreement. We also see it in RCEP. Now, the good news about RCEP is that we have had weak original ASEAN plus one foundations. In other words, ASEAN has been working on services trade, including within ASEAN for a long time, but some of those commitments are quite limited. And out of the 160 sectors and subsectors of services trade, if you look at what ASEAN has done, they have only a portion of those services sectors that are actually covered by existing commitments. And that again, doesn't mean that you can't trade in those uncovered areas, but it means that the risks are higher of rule changes or licensing changes, qualification problems, difficulties with, with investment, et cetera. It becomes very challenging. And so again, what RCEP has done is help to provide greater stability for businesses in the region. Slightly unfortunately, and especially for companies, you will think it's very unfortunate, the way in which RCEP does this is extra complicated for companies to understand. And the reason for that is that the rules apply to everyone. So the chapter on rules is the same for all members, but the country specific schedules, which are different anyways, because again, they're about what I agreed to do and what you agreed to do in your country. They don't always agree. They, we're not always agreeing on exactly the same commitments, but even more complicated in RCEP, half of the members use one way of approaching this and half of the members used a very different way of approaching it. Doesn't mean that they gave you better or worse access, but as a company, it can be very challenging to figure out what the differences are and can I deliver this service? And if so, what are the, what are the restrictions on me delivering this service? So I'm gonna tell you this now as companies, RCEP is, complicated for the way in which the scheduling happens. And I'm gonna give you a tiny description of that. For more information, we have a couple of booklets that we've produced both for the Ministry of Trade and Industry here in Singapore, and also for the Singapore uh, International Chamber of Commerce, SICC, that deal with services in a little more detail. So at the end of the slideshow, I'll give you the links and please, I encourage you to go check them out because this can be challenging to understand. The rules themselves are very helpful. And in particular, I would say for services companies based in Cambodia or across the, the region who want to deliver services in another market, there are some really helpful rules to help limit qualification and licensing requirements. That is important because that is the main way that our countries in this region stop the delivery of services across borders is by requiring very restrictive licensing and qualification 
requirements that make it impossible for foreign firms to compete. That is to be limited under RCEP. And there are a number, depending on where we are, of performance requirements that are now gone for services, like you are only allowed a certain number of branches. You are only allowed to hire certain kinds of local staff. You are only allowed to invest with certain kinds of structures and equity requirements. I think that is very helpful for firms because it tells you what the rules will be across all of the RCEP member markets before you try to deliver services or invest in those markets. So let me give you a little bit more detail on how this works. The split in the way that we have done services left half of the members using what we call a positive list. And you'll see a lot of those are ASEAN economies, including Cambodia. So their Cambodian schedule is positive list. And then some countries, and the, the list is at the bottom here, have switched and used a different approach called the negative list. So you then need to be aware of how does your target market schedule services. So you may sit in Cambodia, and so that matters for you for inbound services. But since you are probably a services company, what you really care about is what is my export market schedule look like? Is it positive or negative list? And do I understand the difference between them? So let me just give you a little bit of detail. I, can't, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail. Always happy to answer questions later from you if this makes not as much sense as you would like. But it, I will tell you, it is challenging, especially in just a few minutes to go through how this works. So under a positive list schedule, if you see your sector, if you see the thing that you actually deliver, graphic design, legal services, accounting services, construction, uh, education, tutoring, tuition, uh, tour guide services. If you see the service listed under a positive list, a government has made some kind of commitment. Now, what that commitment looks like is a bit more complicated. We have to unravel it, but the point is that it is included in the RCEP agenda. So on a positive list, if you see what you want to deliver, the service that you actually do listed, that's good news for you because it means there are commitments and you can now take advantage of that under our side. Under a negative list, you have to have the opposite mindset. And this gets very complicated for companies. If you don't see your sector listed, you are allowed to deliver that in our sector. Okay, so what does that mean? If I am a graphic designer, under a positive list, I want to see the word graphic design or design services so that I know that the government has committed something in my sector. If it's a negative list, the other half, I don't want to see graphic design or design services because it means there is a restriction or a reservation which may limit my ability to deliver. If I read through the whole schedule and I never see graphic design or design services listed in a negative list, it means that sector should be open for me to deliver my services however I choose to do so. Online, in person, set up a uh, local office to do so, however I wanna do it, I can do that under a negative list. And uh, any new service, and this is, I think, especially important for innovative Cambodian companies that want to deliver a service that we haven't even thought of yet, a brand new service, in a negative list, it is automatically open for you to do so. In a positive list, only when it is scheduled is it open for you to deliver those services. There may still be, so, so that's the difference. So in one case, you want to see your sector listed, yay. <laughs> In another case, you don't want to see your sector listed. So this is very challenging for companies to remember which is which. And again, I suggest that you get help uh, if you need to, because this can be very hard for companies to unravel and understand. Under both approaches, no matter how I have scheduled your services, do be aware that you may still have some internal restrictions on delivering that service. You may still have to get a license. You may still have to pass, for example, the bar exam in order to provide legal services. You may still have to have 
credentials or licensing admitted by the local jurisdiction to deliver those services. So be aware that even if your it appears good news in the schedules, there may still be some domestic requirements that you need to fulfill. Eight years from now, all of our economies will be switching towards, towards uh, negative listing. So the reason why we have these two different schedules is that many governments who are used to the positive list need time to transition to a negative list. And those governments that have already started negotiating on negative lists like to stay that way. They don't wanna switch back again. It's very complicated, not just for businesses, but sometimes for negotiators to remember in their own head, <laughs> what is the difference between one way and another way of scheduling services? And so once they have made a transition, Governments also don't like to switch back, which is why we have this weird hybrid right now that eventually will be all negative listing. So let me just show you briefly the difference in schedules. I'm not gonna go into all of the details on here. I just want you to see what they look like. And then you can, again, please read the materials that we've written on this or follow up with questions about what does this mean for my business? So I want to point your attention here. This is a positive sam sample schedule. This is Cambodia's list. Look at the bottom one. Don't look at the legal services for now. Look at the bottom one. So if you are an accountant, which is a very common service that is delivered by companies around this region. If you are an accountant, can you deliver accounting services in the, in, into Cambodia? The answer for this is yes. You can see that B, we have opened up in Cambodia accounting, auditing, and bookkeeping services. We have two, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but we have two columns. One shows you, can you access the market? And the second shows you, are there any restrictions on foreign firms? That limitations on natural, na national treatment means restrictions on foreign firms delivering accounting into Cambodia. And the answer, and again, you'll need a little bit more detail, but the answer to this is you can deliver a lot of services in accounting into Cambodia. This is the positive list. And the reason why I put this up is really just so that you get a sense of what it looks like. So you are, set, you are going through the left column. Do I see the thing that I want to deliver accounting? Yes, great. It means that Cambodia has committed something on accounting. And then I have to figure out what have they offered later but at least it's open for me to do something on accounting into Cambodia. Let me just show you again, very briefly, and I apologize for the time, but it's these things sometimes take longer than you would like, what a negative list looks like. So the opposite, this is Malaysia's list uh, and it's for real estate services. Okay, so different service entirely. So what, what, what does this list mean? Malaysia has opened up services but there is a restriction in real estate services. And so what Malaysia is telling you as a company here is there is a restriction. You cannot easily deliver real estate services. So remember I said, if you see what you do, that's a bit of an issue. Let's be like, oh, okay, I need to look carefully at what is the restriction. The restriction here says, that you have to be a registered person or authorized foreigner with the board of valuers da, 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 in order to provide these real estate services. So the you can deliver lots of services into Malaysia under a negative list, but this particular service has a restriction. And so if you want to deliver real estate services for a fee or contract basis, you need to be aware that you may be able to deliver that from Cambodia into Malaysia, but you are still subject to this restriction. You have to be registered with the board of valuers. So Malaysia is now saying everything else is open in other areas, but for real estate services on a fee, here is our continuing restriction. We got rid of lots of other things. This one remains intact. So the point of showing you these two lists is just so that you get a sense of what those positive and negative schedules look like. And again, you will have to do the frankly, slightly heavy lifting of saying, what is my service that I currently provide? What is the market I want to provide it in? And then you go to that country's schedules and you look to see whether your service is scheduled or not. And that will help you understand what are the conditions that will apply to me trying to deliver that service into that market. 
I want to, before I, I wrap up this session on services, just talk briefly about investment because if services and investment are often combined, we often find that one way to deliver a service is to open an office, to open up an office for travel and tourism, to open up a hotel, to open up something in the foreign market in order to deliver those services. That is also counted as investment. And I think what is very important to note is that all of the RCEP economies were very enthusiastic about investment. So while we have a positive and a negative list for services, everyone went negative listing for investment because they wanted to allow the maximum amount of inbound investment. So you can see in the schedules, including by Cambodia, that investment restrictions are negative listing. Everything is open unless I have told you there's a restriction. So that I think is useful for firms that want to invest for services delivery. There are two kinds of schedules. I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but there is a, just like in services, there is a chapter and there are country specific schedules. The next area workshop will cover investment in more detail and please do tune in there. What I also want to just flag for you now is that we have lots of new rules on investment that are now consistent across all of the members. I think that's great. Missing from this though is investor protection. And again, we will come up with this uh, conversation in the next area workshop. The point I wanted to make was you can now do a lot more services movement around the region and you can more easily invest in RCEP economies than you could before RCEP started. My last slide is just to remind everyone that RCEP is valuable. Again, kudos to IRIA, uh, Australia Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Commerce for recognizing why this matters so much. It allows you to do trade in Asia for Asia. Some parts of the agreement are gonna take time to phase in, but the services and investment commitments are already active. So you can already take advantage of all of the RCEP benefits for services and investment. And that allows you to start creating Asia or RCEP services delivery. You can think about RCEP as your, your market uh, in new ways. And I think that is extremely helpful. There will be an RCEP secretariat set up, which will have support and more capacity building for both officials and for companies. And again, let me just shout out to the Australian government Australia has already committed to a very large facility to help support the new RCEP secretariat in developing these capacity building programs, including those aimed at businesses. So I think this is gonna be very helpful because it will allow companies to unravel some of the complexities. And the last point that I will make before I close is you should look at RCEP as a baseline this is the agreement as it stands now, but it will be improved over time. And especially for services sectors, we can add more services commitments for those positive lists. Remember, I tell you what you're allowed to do. I will add more services. And under the negative list, I will remove some of those restrictions because I will realize that actually the number of real estate contractors not in Malaysia who want to deliver Malaysian real estate may be pretty small. And so ultimately maybe I could remove that restriction and still have the right kind of market uh, protections in place for Malaysian real estate consumers. So it will be, the agreement itself will be improved over time, but it also provides again, those sort of consistent rules across Asia. So let me just show you briefly, and again, you'll have copies of these slides, uh, the SICC website, we have two plain English uh, guides for RCEP. One of them is on services. And on the MTI, Improving Trade Agreements for RCEP, we have a separate booklet just on services trade as well for businesses. So please do look at both of those. Again, you'll have copies of this with the links attached to it later. So let me stop there. Thank you all very much for this opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you, Deborah. Th thank you very much for setting the scene and for, I think, demystifying some of uh, the complexities of, of the RCEP agreement, but also the trade and services chapter. Um, while you were talking, there were a number of questions asked that are relevant to what you've just presented. So I'm going to go back uh, to you, uh, Deborah. There's a, a first mm -hmm. question, which is um, a very, very basic, uh, I would say. 
it's uh, um, ASEAN has many FTAs with China and among the ASEAN member nations. The Philippines also has an agreement with Japan called GPEPA. Is not is our set not a duplication of these trade agreements? This is the first uh, I would say whole question. The second question is you mentioned this uh, a, a schedule of commitments. Uh, where can we get access to this information? Is it publicly available? Like for Cambodia, do we get, can we get the, the schedule of commitment of Cambodia in Cambodia, or is it available elsewhere on website, etc.? Two questions to you there, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me just start with the second one because it's much easier. All of RCEP information is publicly available. All of the texts, all of the schedules, you can look at them now. You can see every country's schedule, Cambodia, Malaysia, China, everybody's schedules for goods, for services, for investment on the RCEP websites. So either in Cambodia Ministry of Commerce website or at RCEP, I forget what the RCEP one is, but Again, I, I tend to use the, the, the uh, New Zealand one just because I find it a bit clearer. But the point is they're available everywhere. So yes, you can look at everyone's schedules. You will know exactly what they've committed. As things change over time, those websites will be updated. And when the secretariat for our set comes into force, they will also consolidate all that information. So very useful for you uh, to find these, these schedules already exist. Do they duplicate existing trade agreements? They have similar rules often across different agreements. This is a part of the world that is very fond of trade agreements. So we have lots of different overlapping deals. We have regional ones, we have ASEAN ones, we have ASEAN plus one, we have bilateral agreements. We have agreements outside of this region. Some of the members are with uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership or CPTPP. We have some with the European Union. So we have lots of trade agreements. Sometimes those rules are identical. So the rule will read exactly the same in different agreements. Sometimes there's a little variation between them. The commitments that individual governments make for services, for investment, for goods also differs. So what you have to do when you are using these agreements is you have to say, what is it I'm trying to do? Where am I trying to do it? And where is my market that I'm trying to deliver it to? And you need to check and then say, which of the possible, are there any agreements that cover this besides RCEP? Then I only need, if, that, if not, I only need to worry about RCEP. If there are a couple different arrangements, you may need to say, which one gives me the best coverage that does what I want in between these two markets and use that one. Because they're all active. They don't, we don't get rid of old ones. Old ones stay in place. So for example, Singapore and New Zealand already have five agreements between them now. You can use the rules from any one of those five. Whatever works for you, use that. But it can be a bit challenging for companies because you need to say which one works best for me. And for that, you may need specialist advice, frankly. Uh, and so, you know, thank you for, for Clint and his colleagues in the legal profession for helping firms figure this out. Um, but the point is, I think from a government perspective, we give you lots of options. And then that allows you to decide which one gives you as a company the best opportunities to trade with your neighbors. So like anything else, RCEP to RCEP, you think, look at RCEP. It's very useful, especially in services because we've had limited coverage in the past in services trade. So for now, I would say, look at RCEP as one of your first things. And then if, there, if that doesn't quite do what you want and there's another agreement, maybe that will work for you too. Just remember, you can't use Japan Philippines if you sit in Cambodia, because you're neither in Japan nor in the Philippines. So you need to make sure that the agreement you pick fits what you're trying to do. Where am I? Where do I want to go? Is there an agreement between those? And then what are those rules? Do I fit those rules? And if so, then I can take advantage of it. And hallelujah, that's, that gives me benefits that no one else gets. That's not part of that agreement. I hope that that answered those two questions. Uh, yes, I think I think it does. And just a quick follow-up question that was uh, put in the chat box. Uh, you mentioned very clearly and extensively the differences between uh, positive list to uh, and negative list. There was a question from one of our participants 
uh, asking whether so all countries are now moving towards a negative listing standards. Is that the case? Yes, increasingly, increase including within ASEAN. So ASEAN agreed to move to a negative list. RCEP agreed to move to a negative list. Asia, I would say, is moving in that direction. Other parts of the world, some are a little more skeptical. If you're a government official, I'll tell you why we have this difference. If I'm a government official, I happen to like a positive list because as a government official, I tell you exactly what I want to do. And if I didn't write it down, it's not opened. So as a government, this feels very comforting. The problem with a negative, with a, sorry, with a positive list for companies is that it's quite confusing, to be honest. Companies are like, I don't understand what this means. I don't understand the way that you've got that complicated chart that you had with four criteria here and four here. And I don't know what to make of that, which is why for companies, they tend to like the negative list because the negative list says, if there's nothing about my sector, great, it's open. I can do whatever I want. I can be in person. I could do it digitally. I could fax it to you if you still have fax machines. I could do whatever I want. Great. So companies like that negative list, but governments feel a little nervous about it because if I had a restriction that I care about and I forget to write it down or I didn't get it written the way I wanted it, all of a sudden it's much more open than I meant. And so for governments, that can feel a little um, scary, to be honest. So governments tend to, when they switch, they tend to list everything. I list everything. <laughs> and then we slowly peel back the restrictions to make it more open. And so that's why we have these two different approaches. One is much more comforting for government, I would say, and one is much easier for business to use. You can have the same outcome both ways. So it's not that one is better than the other. They're just easier to use for one party or the other. Uh, and so that's why we are transitioning slowly to this negative list, but it takes time because government needs to make sure that they haven't missed something. That's the eight year gap we have. Right, thank you, Deborah. I think this was very useful and you, you could see from uh, the chat uh, that we were, um, let's say, while you were talking, a lot of very positive comments. Uh, obviously, as Deborah mentioned, we are going to share all presentations, if that's okay with the panelists. So uh, Elia will reach out to you later on to make sure that you have all the slides, either in your email or downloadable. So th thank you, Deborah. Unfortunately, um, Clint is not uh, able to join at this time. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the second session. I hope Deborah, you can stay with us uh, in case there are additional questions uh, at the end of our session too. And with this, I would like to move to our session two on the private sector perspective on uh, the opportunities for Cambodia in trade in services. Um, and for this, sorry, that's for this um, second session, we have four distinguished speakers, all of them uh, living in Cambodia, working in Cambodia, doing business in Cambodia. I will introduce uh, each of them uh, as uh, we enter in this second uh, session. So I have the pleasure to have Mr. Uh, Kaylot. Uh, Mr. Kaylot is a business owner from uh, Quet and uh, Yellow Tree and an independent director from Akleda and DSP Finance Cambodia. He's been active over the past, I would say, three decades, uh, if, if I, uh, if you agree, uh, Kelot, in the ICT sector, in the telecom sector, in the banking sectors, and also very close to his uh, skill uh, developments. Um, I have uh, three questions to you. You roughly have 10 minutes, uh, Kelot, to, um, to respond to them. Uh, first of all is, according to you, what services sector is the most promising for Cambodia's economic growth? Uh, is it telco, ICT, banking, keeping in mind what we've just heard from, from Deborah on the possibility for Cambodian businesses to sell the services across border or to even open branches uh, overseas. My second question is uh, uh, whether the um, uh, low tech adoptions uh, is an issue in, in Cambodia and is it a deterrent to uh, investment in, in, uh, in the sector by internationals? 
And finally, I would have a third one, which is what could be done to incentivize multinational companies to take advantage of Cambodia services potential. Uh, this is just to provide you a framework. Feel free to elaborate on any of the aspects you feel more relevant. Over to you, Kayla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Swin. Uh, thank you for those uh, very uh, good, good questions. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to, to uh, thank and congratulate uh, IRIA, the Ministry of Commerce, for organizing such an important event. Um, it's a big honor for me and to have the opportunity to, uh, to join. Um, today, you know, I'm going to try and bring in the more of a, a local business perspective into, uh, into the, the discussion. But at the same time, you know, I will try to learn as much as I can from uh, from excellencies and uh, all the participants, which I already do a lot. But uh, my head got, you know, spin a little bit to to kind of uh, think about what what's the difference between the positive and the and the negative list. Um, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, as as uh, as one mentioned, I, I had a long uh, career as a as a accountant or CFO in the in both the banking and telco industry and that's where I'm going to kind of you know uh, uh, bring the the discussion uh, so to to your first question right um, on you know what are the service sector that that would be promising for 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 Cambodia I I, I think uh, you know the answer to that would be to say all of them but you know, to, to varying uh, uh, kind of uh, extent. You know. On the technology or, or ICT point of view, I think this is uh, the most interesting one where, you know, in the past uh, couple of years, we've seen this has uh, kind of, uh, is one of the most, um, you know, sector that, that saw a significant growth due to the, the pandemic. Um, as the uh, famous Greek uh, philosopher Plato says, necessity is the mother of, uh, of all invention. I'm not sure he said exactly that, but that's how, at least how we, he implied. Uh, through the, the, the pandemic and lockdown and also, you know, consumer were, you know, kind of almost to say forced to find ways to, uh, to, to address their needs. Uh, uh, and and as a as a result, we see a huge um, adoption of uh, of digital. Um, and then you know there are those of us who who need to work from home. You know my firm where I do business right now, we we work with uh, with uh, the likes of uh, Google, uh, Facebook, UNDP during the pandemic to to help on board. Uh, small uh, vendors or, or business, uh, uh, you know, small businesses, especially women. And we saw, a, a, you know, the, the response was very enthusiastic. They, they, they want to know how they want, they would really like to learn how to do, uh, to switch the, the business model to more, you know, from a, a very traditional to a, a more, of a, of a digital. Um, at the same time, I think we, we also noticed that, you know, businesses are adapting to the, you know, to the digitization processes because it's no longer the same where, you know, consumer was, was consuming the products and services in the old ways. Uh, now, the, you know, the behavior changed significantly. So, so they, redefine that everybody got to quickly redefine their you know basically customer segmentation the customer journeys and 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 how they behave in the in, in terms of uh, of consumption data is uh, you know i mean the thing is uh, a lot of us talk about data how how important it is and and almost to some extent, you know, we talk, we kind of become a, a buzzword uh, or overused word. But in reality, this is very important. And, and 
you know, we are seeing that those companies who start to, you know, use and analyze data and understand their customer, they, they could take a very good uh, advantage of it, right? Um, I'm fortunate enough to, to be involved in, in some of the e-commerce uh, and delivery services, which we saw a significant uh, uptake during the, the pandemic. But, but at the same time, you know, we, we also see a lot of other startups um, happening in Cambodia. So this is an interesting time, you know, from, a, from an asset point of view, because technology doesn't, doesn't have border. Um, you know, you, you can do lots of uh, services uh, over the internet uh, and things like that. Um, it's still, you know, it's still nascent, I think, in, in Cambodia, the, in terms of the, uh, the technology startup business. So there's a big, big room to grow. And not to mention, you know, we're talking about where Web3 uh, is going, what are the benefits that will bring and how that fall into the, uh, the, the provisions of, of asset. So that's uh, on, a, on a technology side, right? Um, you know, information technology. On finance, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate as well to, to, be, to have been part of the, the banking industry uh, for 20 years and still am. Um, and I have to say that, uh, you know, the, the, the way Cambodian government have handled the, this uh, crisis of the pandemic was nothing short of, uh, I don't know what, what to say, but uh, it, it's extremely good job, right? I, during the, the second wave of the uh, COVID, I volunteered to the, to the front line and, you know, seen firsthand how uh, how the government managed the, uh, the, the reaction and the, the taking actions to, to support and, and decide on, you know, what to do with the, uh, and the strategy around how they manage the, the uh, pandemic. So fast forward, we, you know, Cambodia is fully open in terms of the economy. I think we, uh, we see, you know, uh, the ADB, uh, the World Bank is, is having a positive outlook for, for our uh, growth resumption. Uh, on, the, on the banking sector, uh, you know, if, if on a sector kind of level, the central bank did an extremely good job in, you know, in, during the pandemic as well, right? you know, through accommodative monetary policy, but at the same time, you know, trying to protect the stability of the financial system. I can go into a lot of, you know, uh, technical details on what uh, the measures uh, the NBC has done, but, you know, I think so far we, we see that the, 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 system works, uh, the stress test are, are showing, you know, uh, that banks have sound uh, capital base to, uh, to absorb any, uh, any uh, negative uh, impact from, from pandemic. And the good news is now we are, you know, the economy is, is open again. So, yeah, I, I, I think that that would be, uh, you know, my kind of summary on the on the banking uh, services on telco side you know basically uh, there is a need for for a constant need to improve the quality you know the access the affordability um, I understand as well that you know the legacy uh, 4g networks, they still need to to uh, to monetize them and get the payback on it. But you know the opportunity is there to go to five G, right? Uh, in terms of you know how to uh, support the uh, the industry 
4.0, if you wish, uh, you know, which involves high speed precision automation, uh, etc. Um, I think AI would would be uh, would be a part of that. Uh, so so that we, you know, have a strong or solid foundation to enable um, additional or new innovation uh, disruption uh, in the AI. Uh, area just just to uh you know to to add a little bit on on the opportunity in the in the services right um you know from my uh, point of view and the, the the businesses that i'm dealing with uh, there is also an opportunity to look at the esg uh, uh segment uh, sustainability is is a is a emerging dynamic um I think you know there's an urgency to deal with uh, with uh, sustainability, where you know, Cambodia is also a part of uh, or a party of of the initiative. Uh, uh, we were you know we were in the COP twenty six. Um, growingly, businesses look at you know ESG or sustainability as a as a competitive advantage. So there are space uh, or opportunity there to to uh, you know to to do something about it, and not just for existing business, uh, because this is totally. I think it's almost a very very new um, kind of uh, opportunity. Then um, to your second uh, question, uh, Sven, is whether low technology adoption is a deterrent. Uh, to investment uh, in Cambodia. I think generally, or in, as, a, as a matter of principle, uh, low technology adoption is an issue and will always be, but I don't think it's unique to just uh, Cambodia, right? Um, as a local, I, I see ev an evolution, you know, changes over time. Let me just Kind of give you an an example, right? I'm I'm involved with the uh, with a social impact uh, outsourcing company sitting on their board, and we we are providing uh, a an autonomous driving artificial intelligent kind of machine learning services for our clients uh, for the client based in the U.S. So who would have thought, uh, you know, Cambodia would be able to do this kind of thing? Uh, we we are giving, uh, you know, jobs to about two hundred people now, and uh, and we hope to ramp it up even further in twenty twenty two. So you know, we have a young population. I think the median uh, median age of our people is around 23, 24. And, you know, we know that they can adopt uh, and learn quickly. Um, also, you know, the thanks to the, 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 the effort by the government, I think the education is, uh, uh, the quality of education is improving. Um, we see emergence of education technologies. Uh, the government is is also uh, Ministry of Education is also uh, uh, adopting uh, edu you know education technologies, uh, especially during the pandemic, to to ensure the smooth learning. Um, so, and one of the strategies by the royal government is to. Uh, to adopt an e-government uh, strategy, and that that will be a massive, massive move to to uh, towards a digital uh, adoption. So, Not so sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You have one minute to conclude. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I think you know we we still have some room for productivity to go, but it's nothing. You know, I think it's uh, it's it's always uh, you know. It comes with the stages of uh, of development of you know most countries. I would say. 
So in terms of uh, uh, quickly to the, your your last uh, question, uh, Sven, uh, you know what what can we do more? Right? I mean, in you know, there are narratives about whether the small economies or larger economy will benefit more or less from ASEP. I think in context, you know, whether it's a small on a small base or small on a big base, uh, it's it's questionable in in my mind. Cambodia, you know, we have a lot going for it, and uh, you know, we and and we are one of the fastest growing economy. Um, the thing is, you know, how do we adapt both the private sector and the government to? Uh, take advantage of the benefits of asset through whether through you know reform through uh, innovation etc so yeah i i think uh, those would be my my uh, answers if uh, if there's anything uh, you know i miss please uh, let me know uh, thank you Thank you, Kela. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your experience. Also explaining that uh, there are a lot of different sectors uh, where we don't necessarily see Cambodia as, as a player. Uh, you even mentioned uh, machine learning and working for U.S. companies in Cambodia uh, with the number of staff that you have hired and trained. So I think it gives a different image of what Cambodia is and the potential for investing in Cambodia in the services sector. So thank you again, Kelot, for being with us. Uh, if you don't mind, please stay on the line. There might be questions to you uh, later on in this uh, session. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, next uh, next speaker um, joining us um, on this second session is Ms. Uh, Farik Ratana. Uh, Ratana has almost 25 years of experience in international trade, investment, private sector development, and finance. She's currently the private sector and investment senior consultant for various international organizations. She's also an independent director for ACLIDA and for I Finance Leasing for Cambodian companies. She's also on the advisory board of Quer Enterprise, of Impact Hub, and Small World. And in parallel, she is the founder and the chairperson of the Cambodia Community of Investment Professional, which is a CFA community in Cambodia, to build local skills in finance while promoting Cambodia as an investment destination. So, Ratana, thank you for joining us today on this panel. Um, I have three questions for you, and uh, as for um, uh, Kaylord, we have roughly 10 minutes of your time. So my first question, based on your experience and your expertise, is why would investors from RCEP countries in the services sector choose to invest in Cambodia versus in other ASEAN member states? Second is, do you feel that Cambodia financial sector re is ready to compete and to be open for more competition from larger players in the region. We've heard a bit on this from Kelo. And finally, uh, how do Cambodian services company prepare themselves for internationalization? Thank you, Ratana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for this uh, great initiative uh, in uh, demystifying uh, RCEP. Uh, from my side, I'm far from being a specialist of RCEP. Uh, I'm not either an entrepreneur. Uh, I would describe myself more as a privileged witness of uh, the evolution of uh, Cambodia. And I'm quite a fervent advocate, you know, on the about the opportunities that the country uh, can offer. So, um, to answer your question, uh, Cambodia, I think, was already a very uh, attractive, I mean, for investment in services even before RCEP. But RCEP should uh, indeed, I mean, provide additional um, benefits. Uh, without being too exhaustive, uh, we can mention a few points. Uh, first, it's a business-friendly environment. Uh, as you know, 100% uh, ownership uh, is allowed. There's few restrictions, few uh, no discrimination, and attractive uh, government incentives. Uh, a recent example uh, is the new law um, uh, on investment that provide incentives in additional priority sectors uh, that are focusing on services uh, like research and development, so digital industries, uh, but also in sectors that require expertise that we do not have necessarily in Cambodia, uh, like green energy, for example. Uh, the needs. Uh, the size of Cambodian market is uh, indeed quite small, but the needs in terms of services uh, that are linked I mean, to the growth and development of the country uh, are very important. And uh, 
I would say that they are everywhere in services linked to education, IT, health, uh, expertise on infrastructure, on agriculture, uh, energy, climate change, etc. And the government, uh, the Cambodian government, is conscious about that. Uh, and uh, as Excellency uh, Sim So Kang mentioned, you know, like um, in his uh, introductory uh, uh, speech, uh, and the next policy uh, priorities will focus on the digitalization, energy, education. So, um, yeah, third, um, I would say that uh, Cambodia is also a great entry point, I mean, to cover the region. Uh, many companies that I know, you know, uh, use the country as a pilot market to test their business models. And it's especially, uh, it is especially, you know, like practical uh, in, in, in services. Uh, with the idea later, I mean, to roll over, you know, in the region, uh, because the market is small, uh, quite receptive uh, regarding innovation, and also because it's easy, I mean, to settle, uh, open a company or hire foreigners uh, if it is needed. And beyond, I would say, the investment uh, from RCEP countries' uh, investor, uh, the country is also attractive in general, I mean, to foreign companies that will register in Cambodia, but will serve, you know, um, RCEP countries. Uh, just one example, I just discussed with uh, a French company uh, that is specialized in uh, social engineering. Uh, apparently, I mean, there are very, very few in the world, and they have chosen uh, to settle in uh, Cambodia as a base uh, for Asia. And they plan already to serve the region, including China, uh, from, from there. So I'm not sure that it was uh, really motivated, you know, like by RCEP, but um, companies involved in services uh, definitely have more opportunities uh, provided uh, with this agreement. Uh, so when on one side you have, you know, like this market that uh, that uh, that is involving and that requires more services, more expertise, and the other side you have like this conducive environment. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, Cambodia, I mean, is, um, is, so, is so interesting, I would say. So this is the first question. Uh, for your second question, um, is Cambodia financial sector ready uh, to uh, compete? Um, I would say yes. Uh, I rejoin uh, Kaylot, you know, like on his uh, analysis. Um, in fact, competition is already here in the financial sector, uh, and particularly in the banking one. Um, you also have in insurance, for example, uh, some, some big players uh, like Prudential um, or Manulife. Um, and um, it's a it's a, it's a sector that uh, that that is yeah strong uh, resilient uh, and also very carefully regulated and the National Bank of Cambodia uh, has done also a great job um, uh, in in regulating the sector and and making it uh, um, stronger. Uh, we could see that during uh, the COVID, uh, for example, where most of companies, especially in the banking sector, uh, has, uh, has performed very well, in fact. So if big uh, players are coming in the market, as long as they're uh, bringing something um, in, in uh, particularly expertise, uh, they will be welcome. Uh, Cambodia has always been, I think, uh, very, very pragmatic uh, in this regard. Um, and we can say that, in fact, uh, banking sector is already very, very competitive and very international. Uh, this is a sector that has received a large share of investment and uh, particularly impact investment uh, in the past uh, for private sector, but also from DFI because, uh, because of the importance of, um, of uh, inclusive um, uh, finance uh, and the importance of MFI, you know, like as a as, as a factor for financial inclusion. Um, so Cambodia has 54 uh, commercial banks. It's huge uh, considering the size of the country. And among these uh, these uh, 54 commercial banks, maybe only 20 percent are exclusively owned by Cambodian or majority owned locally or or. or with a joint venture. So it's, it's, it's not a lot, you know, 20%. And the rest, uh, they're fully uh, foreign-owned. Um, but in fact, this uh, investment 
uh, have allowed you know like uh, the sector uh, to modernize and to build also better standards uh, you still have a lot of needs uh, true uh, in terms of services and expertise uh, linked mean to um, digitalization uh, or data analysis um, you also have a lot of needs in um, in um, financial markets uh, for example with uh, technical tools uh, but overall, um, uh, you still have, you know, like a, a lot of opportunities uh, for companies, I mean, to enter uh, the market, but also uh, additional opportunities uh, to export uh, some services. Um, I agree with Kaylot uh, here, you know, like he mentioned very good examples uh, in relation, I mean, to innovation and um, in fact, you also have, you know, like few banks that have already internationalized, like Aklida or, or uh, Canadia, for example, uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, but more interestingly, I would say that um, in the field of uh, finance sector, uh, some companies have adapted, uh, most companies, they have adapted very well, I mean, to the environment, and they develop some uh, competitive advantage. Um, uh, proximity with uh, their, their, you know, like uh, clients um, and expertise uh, regarding uh, frontier markets, um, but also um, and in microfinance, for example, uh, but also more recently uh, with digital payments, uh, you know, wallets, uh, customer friendly solutions uh, for access to finance. Um, in NBC, uh, the National Bank of Cambodia have passed away also with uh, Bakong, uh, which is a blockchain based uh, payment system. Uh, so, um, agree here again, you know, like technology does not have border. Uh, and uh, there's uh, more room, I mean, to grow uh, even in the financial sectors uh, for, um, uh, yeah, for that. So uh, yes, uh, in short, the uh, financial uh, sector for me uh, is, is, uh, is ready, I mean, and uh, to, to, be, to be more open, I mean, to competition. Uh, and uh, the last question um, I think is about, uh, yeah, internationalization in general. Uh, yeah, this is a great question because, in fact, um, we cannot say that most of Cambodian companies, I mean, they're not very well prepared, I mean, for internationalization, uh, and not so many have the capacity, I mean, to export. Um, as you know, uh, Cambodia has, um, uh, is mainly composed, you know, like um, of SME, uh, and they represent the majority of companies. Um, so uh, no, I mean most of these SME are not are not really uh, ready. Uh, they, uh, the internationalization have been, I would say, a topic which is a little bit more popular. I mean, these uh, last couple of uh, years, but it's quite recent. Uh, we could see uh, more trainings uh, happening uh, in this um, in this um, uh, in this top uh, regarding I mean this topic. And I would say that they are more focusing on goods uh, and on uh, good exporting. Um, um, in general, uh, SME are fast facing you know, like many challenges access to, for, for internationalization, access to finance, high cost, um, access I mean, to uh, markets. Uh, but of course, I mean, the first main challenge is the access I mean, to information. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a real issue for them. Um, that said, uh, for services, uh, it's a bit different, uh, particularly, you know, like for companies who are offering high value added uh, services. Um, I would say that uh, for the most successful, uh, successful one, uh, some of them have integrated uh, internationalization from the beginning. We can take the example, you know, like of uh, companies that are doing outsourcing, for example. Um, very often, I mean, they, they, they usually have a good base of uh, clients abroad and, uh, and uh, they, are, uh, they have their own channel. Um, I'm thinking about companies in IT or graphic design or, uh, or um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in IT. Um, 
Regarding startup, it's quite interesting as well because uh, some of the startup companies uh, that uh, um, uh, that are thinking regional from the beginning, um, usually uh, they are advised, I mean, to register, you know, like the company uh, abroad in Hong Kong or Singapore. Uh, so it would be great, I mean, to have the future, you know, like more companies uh, starting, you know, like uh, uh, to, to register in, in Cambodia uh, to internationalize. Um, so uh, regarding, you know, like more uh, specifically uh, access to information in our set, uh, it would be great, of course, uh, as mentioned, you know, like many of the speakers, uh, not only, I mean, to have an agreement, but see, I mean, what it can represent, you know, like in, in the real life and how it's going I mean, to be implemented. Um, I think that honestly, most companies have no idea about how uh, they can benefit, I mean, from asset and how, I mean, to get information uh, from a particular market. Uh, so uh, more tools are probably needed uh, as a, like maybe, you know, like a platform, I mean, to get information from, um, for each uh, market, um, a centralized platform. And uh, I think that uh, when when, um, when uh, the, the challenge mentioned, you know, like by Deborah regarding, you know, schedules of commitment uh, shows that indeed implementation uh, for services company, I mean, can be super complicated. Uh, so yeah, I mean, let's see I mean, how, how it evolves. Um, for bigger companies uh, in Cambodia who have the possibility I mean, to target specific market, to have access to information, et cetera, um, here the issue will be probably more competitiveness, uh, which is another story. Um, and, and yeah, the reality is that so, not so many local companies I mean, can, uh, can, can compete internationally. Um, uh, and uh, well, I mean, that said, uh, there, there's, you know, like maybe uh, some some uh, more, you know, like uh, expertise needed, more tools. Um, and it, it's nice, I mean, to hear, I mean, from Deborah that things, you know, like regarding uh, the RCEP agreement um, are not necessarily set in stone and that uh, adjustment uh, are possible. Uh, and yeah, uh, to to finish, I would say that uh, I hope that uh, Cambodia will be able, I mean, to play, you know, like on their on their strength uh, and take advantage of uh, of uh, this agreement. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rasna. Um, just one quick uh, question, if you could just answer shortly. Uh, you mentioned that some companies, some banks in Cambodia, have started their process of internationalization. Do you mean that they have already invested? Uh, in other markets in, in the region. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, that, for example, is based also um, uh, in uh, in uh, Myanmar and, and Laos. Uh, they took advantage about their knowledge, you know, like in frontier markets uh, to, to settle uh, to settle there. Uh, but the, the, the activity, you know, is not, you know, like that, that large, I would say. All right. Thank you very much. And, and, and that's okay, Lord, please stay with us. Uh, in case we have additional questions uh, to you. Thank you, Rafina. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Harrison White, who is the founder and the CEO of Cambodia Investment Review, or CIR Media. And Harrison is here both as an, an, uh, an investor, an entrepreneur in Cambodia, but also an Australian investor. So meaning that somebody who choose to invest in Cambodia and maybe in other markets, uh, we will we, we'll hear from that uh, on that um, uh, through his presentation. So uh, Harrison, thanks for joining us. Uh, and also a personal thanks for your coverage of ASEAN, RCEP, FTA uh, in Cambodia Investment Review on a regular basis. So my first question to you, Harrison, is really why did you choose Cambodia to start the Cambodia Investment Review? and what advantages it presents compared to neighbors. And also I'm curious that you are covering ASEAN, RCEP, WTO uh, investments extensively. Uh, and so you're best placed uh, to tell us uh, about the readiness and the understanding of RCEP in Cambodia, both by the public sector and, and the private sector. And, and with uh, the time that we have, I hope to be able also to answer a 
question on on the impact that uh, the, this new law on investment that Ratana mentioned uh, may have in getting more investors into Cambodia. Thanks for joining us, Harrison. Over to you. No worries, Ben. Thanks for the uh, lots of topics there to discuss today. Um, hopefully, we can get through them in ten minutes. Starting off with your first question about why we decided to open up a media platform in Cambodia out of all countries. Uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, actually it is rather simple to get a media license in Cambodia um, compared to some of the other regional neighbors, for example, like Vietnam or Thailand. Um, from what I've heard, I've never gone through the experience, but from what I've spoken to people, um, Cambodia is actually the most straightforward. It was a little bit time consuming, um, but it was very affordable and a straightforward process once we got through. So that would be my first point, um, would be the ease of license that we were able to obtain. Um, the second point would be what most people talk about is the 100% foreign ownership allowances that Cambodia provides um, someone like myself, who's an Australian investor. Um, there are some, you do have some more requirements on tax, which is a little bit annoying, but at the same time, not many other places uh, in the region allow for such a, an allowance. And the third reason um, for us is definitely the highly dollarized economy. So bringing in any sort of um, international capital into Cambodia is, is quite simple and you, you don't have to be too concerned about currency issues. Uh, and secondly, also bringing capital back out of Cambodia is quite a simple process. Um, some other regional neighbors is very, some of you can't even do it, let alone the ease of it. So those are really the three main factors for why we created a media, media company in Cambodia. Uh, now, I guess if you're talking about what we've actually been able to achieve, um, I'm going to be trying to talking a little bit about the way that we're also having to the human resources. So we've got a couple of foreign staff that we've been able to, to collaborate with in country in Cambodia, um, but also trying to employ some more local staff uh, has been probably one of our challenges. Uh, this is mostly due to the fact that we're an English language uh, news platform. And so we require basically a very high level of English um, and also understanding some of the concepts of business and investment. So I guess all in all, those are the main reasons why we've invested our uh, company in Cambodia. And then some of the little bit of the challenges that we've had running a media platform. So as you said, we come into the second question, which is about uh, definitely things that we talk about a lot, which is the R7 FTA agreement. Now, from my observations, I don't think Cambodia is very ready to to take on some of the opportunities that these free trade agreements provide. The Cambodian, the Royal Cambodian government has um, obviously for their own optics do love to do these processes. It shows that Cambodia is a, a free market and we're you know, interested in international agreements. Um, but however, I do find that if you're, your everyday Cambodian probably won't even know about these um, agreements. Secondly, what to actually able to utilize them. So I do really appreciate these sort of platforms today for those who are interested to understand more about what's going on. Um, I think Deborah did a very, very thorough and very uh, straightforward explanation of what are some very comp complex um, concepts. And I think the main thing is that we do need just to have more dialogue about what ASIP actually means and what the opportunities provides. That would be the first thing I'd say that Cambodia is not overly ready. Um, so the second thing, I guess, is how do we make it more ready? And the thing I'd like to talk about a little bit in a couple of minutes is the, the fundamentals of, of, what, of what a service business really requires. Now, firstly, it requires uh, human resources. So for our business, we actually want to employ staff in Cambodia for firstly uh, doing a media and content in country and also thinking about how we can expand that out to other regional uh, regional countries, especially ones like Singapore and Australia. These are markets that we've identified um, we can actually try and go into using Cambodian labor. So number one is about having a good workforce that is an international standards. This would be the first thing that I would try and say we can utilize the, the free trade agreements. Um, the second point was being uh, able to actually ensure that we have a steady flow of, of staff that we can rely upon. So again, it's all about mostly for us, it's just human resources. Uh, these are other things I've spoken to in the trade, uh, the services department is that when you do get a lot of um, 
local staff from universities, for example, there is a lot of training that needs to be required. So these would be some parts the Royal Cam Cambodian government could look into providing under the larger RCIP implementation is how do we get Cambodia's workforce ready to actually be able to meet international standards required? It's great to have these agreements that you can then go out and, and pitch to an Australian, you know, to an Australian company or Singaporean company that we can do services in Cambodia. But if you haven't got the staff that are of an international standard, even if you're 10% of the cost, you just simply can't provide the service. So this is by far the number one aspect for us as a service business we need to ensure is that we can find staff that are of international standards. Now, moving into the third question, uh, I guess I sort of cover a little bit of the gaps. Um, what I've found interesting and spoken to many, many people about, I guess you could say the new law of investment or free trade agreements. This was never one of the things that they ever spoke about to me as their top five pain points. I never had a meeting with someone and they said, you know what, Harrison, what we need is another free trade agreement. That's just the truth, the honest answer. Everyone always talks about, you know, ensuring that you have, you have the investment pyramid, you have at the bottom, you have, you know, political stability, which Cambodia definitely has. You need to employ more infrastructure. Um, Cambodia has a pretty good uh, internet and I find it actually pretty affordable, pretty accessible, um, definitely in the cities. But I think we do have for, for trade, for services that is very important, having a good, a good internet. So infrastructure, you know, for us is the internet, which I find very good. Um, so those are sort of the platforms that, that we need. So moving to the next level is the, the, the education part that I talk about all the time. So we, we really need to have focus on this. Um, what I would like to see some more from the Australian government, just because we're talking about Australia today, would be helping us to perhaps in some sort of way, create a fund where we could uh, finance the training ship of some of the human resources that we need. I know that in the new law, new law and investment, there are incentives if you do actually go and train some new staff. However, it requires you to put the capital, the capital up. And a lot of this is at the back end. So once the profit's been made, then you can claim that back. However, we're still struggling to how we make profit. So I, I, I still feel the new law and investment is a little bit, you know, uh, the cart before the uh, horse before the cart, sorry. Um, we really need to just get those, the basics in of, of business, which we need to have uh, good, good staff, uh, international standards, and then some, I guess, some assistance from either government or, you know, other public, public sector organisations of, of how we can um, assist to, to train these staff. So we're talking about, uh, you know, perhaps working with some universities, which we currently do at the moment. Um, however, I, I still find that there, we, we are lacking some more assistance in these areas. But I guess in summary, um, I think Cambodia has some fantastic opportunities. You know, it is a very small market. It's probably, you know, towards the bottom on that list of 15 in GDP, of course. Um, but as technology grows ever better, I think Cambodia can really find itself as a niche in, in trade and services. Um, we just need to work on the, on the human resources. English here is pretty good, but it could be better. Um, but the international standards is the one that we really need to see the most investment in to make use of these, of these free trade agreements of, of anywhere. They're multilateral or bilateral. It, it, we need to get international standards into Cambodia. And you could argue that's in every other sector too. You need construction sector or if we're just talking about the services sector, it's international standards. And uh, I hope that's the one key takeaway from my 10 minutes today. Thank you, Sven. Thank you, Harrison. This is uh, to, the, to the minutes, so excellent. And thank you for covering all these different aspects and for giving me an excellent condition. As you say, education is one of the key issues and something that we really focus on because our next speaker is, is the person we uh, can talk to on, on education. Um, uh, please, Harrison, stay with us and in case we have additional questions at the end. Uh, I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Ashley Irving, who is the principal of IDP Cambodia and the vice president of OSCHAM Cambodia. Uh, we have Ashley here in both his capacity as uh, uh, an expert in the education sector. Um, Ashley, is, after a 20 year career in the corporate banking, culminating with the position as a state director at Rothschild Bank, decided that English language training, and I quote him, would be more fun. 
So he has been working with AC, the Australian Center for Education, for 10 years, and now regards Cambodia as his home. And before taking his position with AC, Ashley was the Director of Studies and Admin Manager at the Access Language Center in Sydney and Teaching Center Manager with ANES in Sydney. Um, I would like also to stress that uh, Ashley is, uh, holds different board positions with OSCHAM Cambodia as the Vice President, but also with the ASEAN OSCHAM as the current president and with EIBC Cambodia. So Ashley, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, you heard that education is one of these uh, key, I would say, constraints that we're still observing in Cambodia. I know you've been a very strong advocate of investment into Cambodia, especially, but not only in the education sector. Mm -hmm. So I have a question to you, which are quite similar to uh, those I've just asked um, uh, Harrison. The first one is obviously, why do you choose Cambodia for uh, an IDP? And what advantage does Cambodia com present compared to its neighbors? Why do you think there aren't more uh, foreign education providers in Cambodia? And what can we do maybe to offset to attract them? And uh, going back to uh, what Ratana was saying, what Harrison was saying on the need to get more information on the benefits, on the opportunities created by RCEP, um, do you see a role in, in, uh, for OSCHAM or those OSCHAM receive requests for information, for assistance? from its members or from potential Australian investors interested in Cambodia to get more information on, on what is RCEP, what it means for Cambodia and what it means for Australian investors. So again, Ashley, thanks for joining and the floor is yours. You have roughly 10 minutes. Thanks, Fran. <coughs> Just coming through clearly. I've always had technology. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a bit of background on IDP, uh, a little bit different. We've been here for just on 30 years. We started off with the English school ACE um, in the, with the UNTAC forces teaching um, locals and troops English. It was sponsored by AusAid back in those days, so we were very much an NGO start. And over time, we've grown into a commercial entity and we have two separate groups of owners. We have 50% owned by the 38 of the Australian universities. And we also, the other 50% is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. So we're a, we're a listed company in Australia. And IDP currently operate uh, their state student placement business or our student placement business in 32 countries around the world. And the IELTS English test, which we're one of the co-owners is operating in more than 50 countries. But in terms of English language training, we have, office, we have schools in two countries only, that's Vietnam and Cambodia. So this is our background. Um, and it's probably colored my view to an extent because when I hear people talking about investing in Cambodia, all over here is how can we invest in Cambodia to make money now? When we found that it took a long time of investment and hard work to build the business to the stage where we're now, um, I believe quite successful in our sector. Uh, 10 years ago when I started, we had two schools in Cambodia. We just opened, sorry, three schools in Cambodia. We just opened our, sec our third one and we had approximately 6,000 enrollments per term. Uh, prior to COVID, we had five schools and about 23,000 students enrolling every term to study English. We've now expanded that to six schools. We opened another one during COVID and we are returning to our pre-COVID levels um, fairly rapidly. So English continues to be something which parents in particular um, value for their children and their future prospects. Now, in terms of um, what advantages Cambodia provides, well, I'm speaking from an Auschamp perspective, you've got obviously the English language, but English being the language of ASEAN, the business language of ASEAN. Um, my impression of the English language here is actually quite high. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, we made the decision for the business to be sustainable. We had to look to Cambodians to supply our skills, gap, oh, sorry, our um, recruitment gap if we wish to expand. So we've gone from five English language teachers to 160 over the last 10 years. And I think I, I think the number of expats we have has remained around about 100. So the Cambodian English language teachers are now teaching English to Cambodians. And I've seen the level increase remarkably over the last 10 years, to the point where on our IELTS scale, some of my staff are almost um, returning perfect scores, where a decade ago that wasn't possible. 
So I have, a, I have a slightly different view of the skills gap when people talk about, when I hear them talk about the skills gap, um, well, the skills gap is worldwide and people are looking for immediate returns. So they can come in, set up and make profit immediately. It doesn't work that way. When I started work quite some time ago, um, university students or high school students were not expected to be work ready. That was part of the training cost of setting up business and investing in the business going forward. And governments are now moving back towards this or trying to support this. But the training cost is now being expected to be passed on to education providers, which I think is unrealistic. All businesses should have a training budget. If they don't, then they're going to either shouldn't be setting up or they should be um, expecting their returns to be lower until they've invested time to build the capability of their workforce. Expecting to come in and set up a business and have it ready waiting for you um, is extremely rare. Now, I was asked about why we're not seeing more international schools come to Cambodia. Well, there's obviously from the outside only a small market. And for example, in Australia now, universities are off um, relying on foreign students coming to Australia to fund a large amount of their research programs and their day-to-day -day operations. The um, money from the government and student fees simply don't cover that. It's international students who have made the difference. So during COVID in particular, it's in Australian universities struggling. So they're looking for students to come to Australia. There has been talk about relocating. Some of them, have, such as RMIT, have relocated to countries such as, um, or built already in Vietnam and looking to build their business in Sri Lanka because they feel that offering Australian degrees locally um, would be appealing to um, that market. Prior to COVID, we, have over, we had over 100 universities, both public and private in Cambodia. So when universities or schools look at coming in, they see a service, they see a sector which is predominant, which is largely appears to be overserviced without really understanding what the quality of um, is on offer because the um, compliance requirements are still quite sketchy or if in some, in many cases, non-existent. So for companies to come in and invest where they're looking for, for immediate profit, they see challenges around being able to find staff to fill the gaps in, in the short term. And they're also worried about the competitiveness with local companies in that market. Having said that, we've just recently seen two international schools from the UK set up here in the last month or so. Um, and so they obviously see opportunities here. The British Council from the UK is actually looking at investing more in the, in the market locally here. Um, universities uh, come, and, come and look, but they only look at investing a small, in dabbling and testing it out as a possible pilot market. And we haven't actually seen any real investment from Australian universities setting up in Cambodia. I'd like to see this. I've spoken many times to the TAFE colleges about coming up here and making the investment, but their answer is always the same. You know, how much money are we going to make out of it? And what sort of case will you present for us to come? which I think is the wrong way around. They should be looking at opportunities across the region and seeing Cambodia as a potential base and for their pilot programs to get themselves ready to invest across the ASEAN region. So there has been a lot of investment in education in recent years with the tightening up of the grade 12 exams and the, the opening of the um, larger curriculum into the new generation of schools. So there's, there's, a, there's an awareness of education being important moving forward. But my biggest concern is the gaps in the TVET sector. When I talk with parents, they talk with the student, they're, they're talking about their children going to university to study. And there's many universities have opened to cater to that demand. What I don't hear them talking about is them training in vocational areas where there is, there is clearly a need. And this is something I think that both private enterprise could look investing in, but also the government needs to make it more transparent and easier. Currently, the education in the TVET sector is managed by the Ministry of Labor, which I think has 13 um, subcommittees or subsectors, all of which are responsible for training in their own areas. This is very, very difficult for a, someone like a provider, like a TAFE to come in and they have to deal with so many different departments with so many different requirements and re to set up a business here and make it um, both useful and profitable um, in, a re in a short space of time. So I think streamlining 
the streamlining of the TVET sector would be uh, very helpful. Personally, I'd like to see it with the Ministry of Education. I think it's, it's that important that it can't be left to individual industries to um, address this themselves. I think there needs to be a much stronger understanding in the community. So a campaign to make parents aware of what jobs are available for the future for their children. I know when I drive around in Australia, I look at the cars and the houses that are owned by plumbers and electricians, and they're much nicer than the ones that are owned by teachers. And this is something which will take time. And when you talk to, Sing I talk to Singaporean businesses about how they went from being a backwater in the 50s to the, um, literally the dynamo, they were in the 70s and 80s. And they said the focus was on education, in particular training of teachers. It's an enormous effort put into the training of teachers so that the, um, so that the students would benefit not only in the short term, but the country would benefit in the long term from the um, skills development of these individuals. And we've seen this happen. So in short, I think the TV sector is an interesting one. I think that's where the investment in education should be focusing, should be focusing. University, yes, we must we must have clever people. We must have people who can speak at a, to a, a higher audience. We also need we also need skills in getting the day to day jobs done, repairing roads, repair plumbers who can fix the, who can work on both a large and smaller scale, builders who can build factories, who can build houses, in the provinces, to cater to the, the demand of a, of a of a very very young population. I think it's something like sixty five to eighty percent are under the age of eighteen. So to attract foreign providers, I would streamline the TVET sector and make it easier for investment. I also think we need to look at educating the population more as to what is available to them and not just automatically assume that university is the answer to everything. Uh, in my role of AUSCHAM, and I've been, I was president for three years, I was on the American Chamber of Commerce. I've had very, very little request for more information about free trade agreements mainly because of the complexity, the perceived complexity of them. But the company, countries are coming in and doing their own diligence. They're not relying on the local chambers of commerce to tell them whether it's a good idea or not. Um, they will come and ask to talk to local experts. So I have redirected countries, companies to um, locals who can help them with this, to talk about their specific industries, groups such as Logistics Hub, TNT, coming in, and Linfox. Um, but overall, there hasn't been much interest in particular free trade agreements that's, that I've been exposed to. Um, anything I have, I've actually, I would actually probably send out to one, uh, the legal members of the OSCHAM community who can give more specific information about the agreements. That pretty much covers my time, Sven, I think. Um, but I hope I've answered your questions. Yeah. I'm happy to take any questions that might come up. No, thank you very much, uh, Ashley. I think you cover even more than what I was expecting. Uh, it's very good. I mean, it's a very interesting because what you're describing actually also represents the 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 extent of the agreement of services. I think His Excellency was mentioning in his introductory remarks that when we talk about services, we talk about 160 different type of services. And when we talk about education, it's not only uh, primary education, secondary education, there's education for adults, there is TVET, there is other aspects, which I think you will see covered uh, as part of the positive list that um, Deborah was mentioning. So it means that there is possibility and opportunity for more investment into Cambodia in the sector, although it's restricted and it can appear crowded, as, as you say, but very important to look also at the quality of uh, the education. So uh, thank you very much, Ashley, for, for being with us, both as a, a long-term uh, resident, but also as the vice president of, of Ostrom. Um, I don't have a lot of questions in the chat box on this session. I have one question from Mr. Vanak uh, uh, Tan uh, to you, Ratana, if you're still around. And the question is really focusing on, on the later part of your presentation or of your um, expose, which was on the internationalizations of services. So the question is to you, Ms. Ratana, what should the Cambodian government do to help the private companies get ready for internationalizing? Thank you. <laughs> you only have 
it's, you only uh, have 30 seconds of course yeah i think it's a multi-layered question and it's a bit complicated i mean to answer straightforward uh, however uh, what we can say is that the government has already taken you know like some steps uh, in this regard, uh, there are, I think, uh, some programs uh, at Khmer Enterprise, you know, like providing uh, uh, some training uh, for uh, companies, but it's more, you know, uh, for uh, the export of goods, uh, I think, in the agricultural sector. Um, I know also that there are um, quite a lot of initiatives uh, regarding access to information uh, at MISTI. Uh, where uh, they, they set up, you know, like this um, uh, Khmer SME platform uh, that uh, is linked also to ASEAN SME, which provide information, I mean, for internationalization. And uh, overall, um, I would say there's more and more donors program uh, that are uh, working with the government uh, to provide uh, more information, more trainings on internationalization. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, we need more. Uh, for sure. Uh, but on the other hand, we understand also that there are some um, priorities uh, in, in recently uh, with the COVID, uh, I think that the priorities of the government were a little bit uh, diverted uh, towards, I mean, uh, fighting the pandemic. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, um, there, there's, uh, there's, there's more to do, but there's already, you know, like uh, some good initiatives happening. Right. Thank you, Atana, for taking the question on the spot. Um, so to, to our four panelists, I'd like to thank you very much for being here with us to share your candid views on the investment climate, on the doing business climate in Cambodia in different sectors, uh, from the ICT, the telco, the banking, the education, um, and the uh, media, and the online media. So I don't see any additional questions um, in the chat box, but I'm sure there will be questions after this session, as it's always the case uh, in the past uh, dialogue. So uh, thank you again for being here, uh, for sharing your knowledge, and I hope to see you maybe for our next uh, event, which will be on the investment uh, chapter of our set. So Ashley, Harrison, Kelot, and Ratana, thank you very much. Um, with this, I would like to move to our last uh, session for today, which is the summary of the key considerations and of the discussion we've had today for a continued public-private dialogue on trading services in RCEP. We've heard a lot about uh, the opportunities that Cambodia uh, presents for investors, for companies wishing to do trade in services from Cambodia or into Cambodia. We've heard a lot about the, the gaps as well uh, encountered by existing investors or by potential investors. Um, and we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, one of the leading experts in Cambodia on our set. Uh, and I'm saying that not because he was involved in the negotiation, uh, in advising the government, but also because he is writing a number, a regular number of articles on newspapers, on media, that helps uh, demystify what RCEP is at one in principle Cambodia. So it's a very great pleasure and honor for me to invite His Excellency Soxipana, who's a senior advisor to the Royal Government of Cambodia, to take us through this summary of, of discussion. Before I do this, for those of you who incredibly would not know Dr. Soxipana, allow me to give you uh, a short introduction. Uh, Dr. Soxipana is a practicing attorney and the founding partner of Soxipana and Associate, a law firm in Phnom Penh. He was appointed by Prime Minister Samdek Techo Unsen to hold concurrently the position as advisor of the Royal Government of Cambodia as advisor to the Supreme National Economic Council, SNEC in short, and as advisor to the Council of De for the Development of Cambodia, CDC, with rank of minister. He was reappointed as senior advisor to the Royal Government of Cambodia in September 2018, with the rank of senior minister. In the lead to Cambodia hosting the 13th ASEM Summit, he, he was also interested with the responsibility of the ASEM SOM. And previously, from 1995 to 2005, he served as Secretary of State at the Ministry of Commerce 
and from 2005 to July 2001, 2009, sorry, he served as a director at the International Trade Center in Geneva. Uh, Dr. Soxipana, thank you very much for joining us today. Again, uh, you were uh, kind to join us uh, for the first and the second dialogue. So we're happy that uh, you still like to tell us more about RCEP. Um, and I have basically three questions to you, um, if, if I may. Uh, the first one obviously is, uh, what have we learned today? Uh, we being, we the participant, but also we the, the panelists. Second, it's, uh, you, you've heard that there's still some capacity gap, information gap, knowledge gap, uh, especially from Cambodian businesses. So how, what else could be done to get Cambodian businesses interested in getting more knowledgeable on RCEP, especially the trade and services chapter, uh, and in using the provisions uh, of, of RCEP. And uh, what's the role of the academia, of research institutions? I know this is very close to your heart. You've been very much involved in the AVI in Cambodia, in CDRI in the past. So what is the role of academic institution in Cambodia, Black like area is doing at the regional level, in raising awareness on the benefits and opportunities of our set for Cambodian businesses. Thank you again uh, for joining us, Dr. Sipana. Dr. Sipana, you are muted, sorry. Okay. Ah, okay. Now I'm activated, right? Okay. Yes. Well, when uh, I want to say that with all your, uh, you know, listing all my thing here, uh, you are trying to tell my age, right? <laughs> I'm old and uh, ready to retire soon. But uh, again, it's a, a pleasure to go back memory lane, way back to uh, the WTO days. So that's when we, we met. Uh, I'm, I'm quite, uh, you know, sort of like uh, have a lot of fun listening uh, uh, this morning to various presentation and it sort of gave me an idea where uh, the, the, the missing gap are but just by listening what we said and, and I probably can uh, uh, refer to, um, um, let me see, okay. Uh, Refer to, to Deborah. Deborah was mentioning about the negative list, the positive list, and I listened this morning, and I hear a lot of positive uh, lists and a lot of negative lists. Uh, it means that we cover a certain sector, but uh, there are other sectors that uh, we did not cover, and uh, by default, uh, uh, there are some uh, shortcoming. Uh, in in this whole, uh, I would say the discussion process because I would say we 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 tend to focus quite a bit on uh, the the fintech, uh, uh, the banking sector, that sort of thing. But uh, I want to say that uh, in the service sector, is a lot of other area like, for example, that Cambodia have benefited tremendously. For example, the construction, right? Uh, all this year that. Uh, the booming real estate uh, sector is, in fact, has a lot to do with uh, the influx of uh, technology, of expertise coming from Korea, from China, from Japan, and uh, boosting uh, the, the capacity of uh, our locals. Uh, but that, that's one area, okay? Um, but I, I want to stress more on uh, how I see uh, the, the discussion this morning. Uh, Debra, of course, has mentioned uh, the, the more the, the academic side of uh, the, the, the ASAP, you know, uh, more the rule, the certainty, the uh, specific country schedule, the positive list, the negative list, which is very academic, which is good. Uh, at some point, you got to start somewhere. You got to start uh, going through the schedule. Uh, but for each particular company, uh, it's, it's not uh, a lot, okay? I mean, if you're a lawyer, you have one table, that's it. One table, four column, uh, and, and you just have to uh, try to understand and doesn't take a lot to understand 
what are the sector that uh, you can do business, right? So, so I, I will not uh, touch on that. Um, or it's too bad Clint is not here. He he could cover quite a bit on the other uh, service sector, particularly in the in the accounting sector. But I I want to move straight to uh, uh, the, the the sectoral panel, which is uh, uh, starting with uh, Gay Lot. He he mentioned a lot about uh, the ICT of the banking sector, of the AI. Uh, so it it's quite uh, interesting to see. Uh, all these uh, uh, areas that are quite novel for Cambodia, which I would say maybe at most uh, six, seven years that we're moving into uh, this sector. But I, I want to say that uh, the effect of uh, the Shanghai lockdown is, is, a, is a good uh, example I want to stress, right? That uh, the confidence in uh, China uh, particularly for foreign investor, you know, setting up business in China, uh, there will be some negative, uh, you know, consequence. And it could benefit Cambodia in the sense that uh, people may want to shift some of their uh, service uh, uh, production uh, into Cambodia. So this is just one example. But uh, what uh, K. Lot was mentioning about the AI that he has now 200 some people, uh, quick learner, uh, doing business uh, with the American company. These are a good sign. These are a good area that uh, we're moving forward. Uh, the FinTech, uh, the banking sector, forget about it. I mean, it, it's so big, so wide open already. The insurance sector, it's all uh, wide open. So I would say, things that we have opened way back 20 years ago in the WTO, if you have investor interested, they would have come already, okay? So I think for us, it's only a few sector, new sector that uh, we, we, we open up. But the other sector is already open, uh, legal service, accounting service, construction, engineering, architect, banking sector, you name it. If, if there are business opportunity, that are uh, available, they would have come a long time already. And I want to say in the area of uh, uh, this, this investment, the service sector is all, for, for the, in the case of Cambodia anyway, uh, I don't foresee in the near future Cambodian business uh, service sector going abroad yet, okay? That, that's what the... Uh, Ratana said, right? We 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 still uh, SME uh, knowledge base is still low, so we are not thinking of uh, internationalization yet. So so it's not it's not much the outflow, it's more the inflow, the inflow, inflow. It means that foreign company coming to Cambodia, entering to a JV, a joint venture, a partnership with a local company to do business, to provide services in the Cambodian uh, economy. And this is where I see a lot of uh, transfer of knowledge, a lot of transfer of technology, a lot of uh, uh, business transfer. And for example, uh, to be fair to many Cambodian who struggle to start a business way when we joined the W2, way back then, you know, they don't have the, the, the knowledge nor the, the capacity but 10 or 15 years later, uh, their business is prime for, I, I don't want to say a takeover, but they are prime for a JV with a foreign company. And uh, as, as a law firm, we, we've done quite a bit of, uh, you know, a merger acquisition for a uh, foreign company, for Chinese company, for Japanese company, uh, moving to Cambodia to buy existing service uh, sector provider, you know, for a, a good, good chunk of money. You know, I mean, this uh, local company didn't expect that, oh my God, in 10 to 15 years, they could get an offer of 40% and cash out a million and a half. You know, this is something unheard of. But that is what's happening. The, the, the local reality is that many Cambodian companies start, you know, to, to, to benefit from their struggle, you know, so many years ago. Of course, not all uh, companies are, are uh, in a position to sell their share, but those who can, you know, will definitely benefit. Um, I want to mention a bit what uh, 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 Harrison White has mentioned. He he was a, a bit sort of like uh, complaining that the, uh, the HR, international standard, uh, English, uh, 
it's uh, still a long way to go. Uh, on this point, I, I want to agree more with uh, Ashley, uh, because actually you with IDP, I mean, you know how hard it is to rebuild the, the knowledge, right? Uh, of, of the local people and it takes a long time. I would say it takes 20 some years to, to get the uh, kids to start uh, to learn English and go to college, get the college educated, come back and, and, and providing, uh, you know, a good education with the international English skill. So, so, you know, if you look back 20 years ago, we don't have that. But if you look back now, most of the Cambodian middle class have sent their kids to study either in international school, either not so good local international school, but then many of them send their kids to study abroad. And IDP is, is, a, is a good example. You know, I, I took my son to, uh, to, to IDP the other day because he wanted to go and study in Australia and uh, they have a whole system in place. So I would say uh, for Harrison White, uh, um, you know, human resource uh, takes time, okay? And I would say, if you, I, I'm not saying you should be patient enough to wait four or five more years, but I know I, when I go to a different place, I go to a birthday party, I go to, uh, you know, a, a friend's uh, family gathering, their kids all fluent in English. And, and that's a problem because at some point, the Cambodian will face a serious language issue. Uh, most of these new, the kids of new middle class will not speak Cambodian. That's, that's a problem for the Minister of Education uh, 15 years from now. But for Harrison White, you will have a good uh, labor force that are capable to engage in English, right? At, at I would say, not 100% international level, but at least at international, uh, we saw like a uh, qualified international standard, right? So I think it, it, it takes a while. The human resource takes a while. Uh, but on the uh, other area in the, the, the service sector, I foresee in the future, the opportunity more in terms of merger acquisition of foreign company uh, coming to Cambodia, look at area that they can do business. Uh, and as a lot of other sector than just uh, IT and FinTech and AI. I mean, this is only a portion, right? There's other traditional uh, service sector that uh, Cambodia could benefit. Bear in mind that, uh, you know, uh, in, in say in FinTech or in uh, AI or in uh, uh, th that area, it required a quite an advanced educational level. But there are other sector where you don't need that high level of, uh, of, of education skill. And this is where I refer to, to Ashley. Ashley is uh, talking about, uh, you know, TVET. Uh, it's already the process there. Uh, a few years ago, I think uh, about four years ago, I, I handle uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I oversee uh, the Mekong Lanchang uh, Framework Corporation Framework. They gave it to uh, our National Polytechnic uh, $5 million of equipment, of uh, TVET equipment, you know, robotic, uh, you know, telecom, uh, hydraulic engineering, that sort of thing, to train uh, Cambodian worker uh, so that they, they can get a job, you know, in the various uh, IT uh, and engineering field. Japan recently uh, provided to the Royal University of Phnom Penh uh, a machine learning program, curricular program, and there's other you know, a program that are uh, that donors start to come to Cambodia, and mainly because they want to invest into the capability, uh, the capacity of the Cambodian workforce, so that they can eventually move up uh, the, the, the 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 level of uh, their service uh, uh, side. So I would say, you know, all in all, uh, it's a it's a good thing. I would say it's it's not like a a game changing anything from uh, uh, this ASAP on the service sector is not a game changing for Cambodia, uh, but it consolidate, it, uh, it deepen the roots of our commitment uh, that we are open uh, uh, to welcome foreign in investment in the service sector. But all in all, I would say it's a positive step, okay? And uh, we, we just have to uh, work harder as uh, Harrison White and Irving, Ashley Irving was saying that let's build the capacity uh, of, uh, of our workforce 
so that we can uh, be a good uh, local provider when uh, international company look at Cambodia to, uh, to, to invest in the certain service sector. Of course, Cambodia is a small market. Uh, it, it's quite clear that uh, certain uh, sector are only for domestic market driven. So uh, like the real estate construction, for example, but uh, it's quite limited. But there are other uh, sector like the, the IT, the technology side that uh, Cambodia can really skip the, the, the boundary of Cambodia and start looking at the, at the region or at least a neighboring country who are in similar uh, level of uh, knowledge base and we can capture some of this market. But all in all, I think this ASAP service uh, uh, sector chapter is, uh, is, is, a good, is a good thing. It, like I say, it's not a uh, sort of like a, a game changing or anything, but it is uh, another step in the right direction. All right. Thank you, Swan. Thank you, Excellency. If you allow me uh, just a quick follow up question, which is uh, on the role of uh, research center education ah, okay. uh, institute yeah. in Cambodia, yes, yes. do you? <clears throat> Do you suggest like you we do like you did uh, 20 years ago with your shepherd baton going under the mango tree? And is it the role of government officials to go out and say, this is the OSAP agreement, this is why it's good for you and, and please get ready for when the investor come? Is there a role for institutions like ABI, for instance, I'm thinking of this one or CDRI to, to do more or is it more for chambers and business associations like OSCHAM, IBC, to learn about the potentials of RCEP and explain that to their members? Well, I, I think for sure the government have done its job. I mean, their job is negotiate, okay? Uh, and, you know, they've done their job, they got the agreement going. Now, I think it's a, it's a role of the actual stakeholder who will be in the business of uh, exporting, of uh, investing. So I think the role of private sector is it's clearly uh, a, the front line, right? Um, the, the, the issue of, uh, of Think Tank and uh, uh, Development Institute is that they, they are quite generalist, okay? If, if I can be blunt, because they, they, they cover so many uh, field sector of uh, economic sector, that sort of thing. So they are not practitioner, but they can do the general, I, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, uh, Deborah, uh, you know, this sort of event, you know, uh, they can do it, you know, general stuff, you know, presentation, that sort of thing. But in terms of, you know, actual sector issue where they, you know, uh, they, the company need to, 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 to understand, I mean, it has to be the, the role of the, the chamber because, but again, there's a limitation in the chamber itself because the chamber, most of the time, they end up doing a, a lunch series, a breakfast series. It's not deep enough. They should have a more in-depth uh, capacity building. They should uh, invite their own practitioner, their own private sector who have uh, sort so of like technical knowledge on a specific sector and try to explain. If I take, for example, the, the, in, in the area of architecture or construction, right? Uh, the chamber could invite a few of their member who know in and out about the issue relating to their particular service sector. They could have a series uh, of seminar to explain, hey guys, you want to break into the construction sector? These are the things that you need to do. Okay, you want to break into the architecture sector? These are the things you need to do. Uh, think tank, they, 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 they're broad generalists. They, they can talk, you know, all day about general stuff, but they are not good at procedure. Uh, I don't think I would want an advice from a, a, a think tank on a sectoral issue, okay? You know, uh, so, so again, there are roles for everybody, but uh, focus role should be on the chamber, uh, tapping their membership who have specific expertise in a particular service sector, yeah. Thank you, Excellency. Thanks. Very clear. I think the message is well heard, especially from Austria, my fault. Uh, Excellency, you, you started by saying that I was teasing you on your long career uh, or in, in different different lives. Uh, I am being, I am told that you are going to defend yet another thesis very soon uh, yeah. in French. 
So I wish you good luck for that. And you're practicing what you preach, which is uh, training is a life, lifelong uh, learning process, right? So good luck uh, with that. Yes. Th next month, I'll fly to Paris to uh, to defend my thesis. It's about, it's about law, right? It's uh, how the common law and civil law cohabitate in Cambodia. And after this, I promise I'm going to retire. Uh, yes, well, I, I, I've heard that at least a dozen times in the past uh, 10 years, so uh, I have doubt on that, you know, and, and we, we need your XNC for doing the same work in Laos, so don't forget that after the thesis, you still have a set of, uh, of workshops, uh, and I'm sure Jeremy will, uh, will remind you that as well. So okay. thank you, XNC, for providing the, the summary uh, to uh, live on a very good and positive note. Um, and with this, I'd like to close this uh, third session and give the floor back to uh, Jeremy Gross, who's going to take us through the uh, closing session of this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sven. And thank you to all the presenters this morning uh, for, for uh, the discussions that we've had. And can I also thank uh, His Excellency Sotsifana for his uh, insightful reflections on today's uh, presentations and discussions. I think it is also a, a part of a sort of reality check with real judicious optimism about uh, the way for moving forward. So we know that uh, change is a process that would take time, but uh, certainly we have time and uh, I don't think uh, any time for retirement for you. So I really hope that we'll be able to invite you back to, to future uh, discussions and uh, area capacity building events. On that, uh, I would now like to invite uh, His Excellency Sim Sok Heng to deliver some closing comments on behalf of MOC. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, and <laughs> nothing much to say. Uh, a lot of experts and my senior and also the investor who are mentioned a lot of good things uh, about Group U and expert also explain very well on ourselves and ASEAN plus what FDA, how different depend on the question from there. And I'm very happy uh, to see it very interactive. I have an hour of one minute, just listen all from the beginning until now. Uh, um, YC and still a lot of uh, good audience here, a little bit uh, still 143 people uh, online listen. Yeah, it's quite uh, successful for this uh, morning uh, unpack. Uh, and I see some investors here, uh, they say a very uh, good thing about Cambodian trade and survey and aspect of investment. And I like uh, some point of them. Uh, they are, have to bring some international standard to Cambodia. Yes, it should be uh, step by step. We have to go the direction. No choice. If we want to go out, we have to bring in the international and build up ourselves and let on go out. And the most I like is uh, Ratna mentioned very clear. Uh, we are as um, yeah, uh, see, all right. Uh, 98, 99% depend on the, the survey. Uh, up, most of them are MSME. And uh, they still, uh, we need to do more uh, to tell them about ourselves. And thank uh, Ratana, she uh, very active when she was in Eurocharm. I met her and we worked together many things. And uh, some are talking about how to prepare Cambodian go international. I really like this one. We have no choice. We uh, now, uh, we are starting a good momentum on exporting good. But service is just very uh, early stage. So how should we push for the export service? This is uh, the thing that uh, we are going to do. And Dr. Nam mentioned time about command the pride. Yes, we're doing more and are um, more coming. Uh, step by step that we uh, unable to uh, pump in immediately, but at least uh, go there. Uh, I will give you some uh, what we are going to do as well. But before that, uh, before I forget, uh, some are talking about uh, looking for document. You can go to MOC website, uh, moc.gov.ka, you can find all uh, in Khmer Week. Also, we are translating them, uh, a little bit challenge for translation English to Khmer for also agreement as whole there and also English. And also you can go to awesomesecretariat.org for all the whole of tech and uh, service commitment, everything there. Uh, just only what 14,440 uh, 40 something pay. So uh, you spend a whole month <laughs> to read all of that document. And what we to do next? 
you may see that the re, uh, the new release uh, of study from area uh, so that Cambodia uh, may benefit but also could we contribute to Cambodian GDP to to 3.8 percent this is a big number amazing and as well as the World Bank just released as well a few months ago they mentioned about Cambodia is among the top three that uh, for economic gain and also export growth so this is quite interesting this is just only number of study now today why i like most is like dr sipana mentioned my senior mentioned private sector how to help to push it to make a reality not just only research member so from next month on because uh, during this month and uh, the communal election comes soon so next month on after that we uh, ministry of commerce going to have a specific training sector by sector group by group for example we start with rural origin we may go for example like garment uh, factory or footwear in one group and we call only that specially and we go to tell them here yeah, this is rural origin for you to export in also country that is to footwear to garment or the thing like that and later on we continue to agriculture how you export agriculture why we go into the province itself for example we go to Batabong by calling Batabong Pailan Bante Min Jai Po Sat and nearby come in to listen and later on to electric something like that we going with rule and soon after that we may go into service sector so this is the thing that I'm looking forward closely with the area how we can go in deep and also the key player here is business association my senior already mentioned that this is a uh, quite true if no business we the government not earning <laughs> that one so the business people itself who have to utilize most and make it and let on it turn to be like number economic growth that area did it and also the world bank did it so i may end up this uh, closing demand shortly i don't want to keep everybody hungry during long time thank you so much and looking forward to have this good excellent panel like today more uh, with area and coming in the next session thank you so much and goodbye uh -huh. thank you thank you very much excellency simsok heng it has been a pleasure once again to co-host this uh event with the ministry of commerce you mentioned going forward working with area i can assure you area is here to support you and we very much look forward to discussing how we can support you in the future one of the things you just mentioned though, which is of course important, is how events such as this is uh, key for bringing uh, business and uh, other sectors together to actually think about the issues. So thank you for that. Uh, also, uh, as I think uh, Deborah earlier in her presentation, she actually gave us a little heads up about what's coming next. Uh, we did mention, I mentioned earlier that this is the third of the, the fifth dialogue. So the next one is going to be on investment and the final one will be on trade facilitation. So stay tuned. We very much look forward to be uh, welcome you, all of you back to the next two dialogues in the, uh, in the short term future in the next month, uh, month to two months. So on that, can I end by thanking all the people watching uh, and to have, uh, who are participating in today's event, as well as the support of uh, the translator, Mr. Som, uh, my colleagues at Area for making sure everything has run so smoothly. On that, I would like to cl close today's event. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>